So in 3.3, talking about two major skills from Algebra 2 that are going to come in handy again um, in this class, which is long and synthetic division. But before we start talking about division, we need to talk about <clears throat> a lot of, well, I guess the best word for it is jargon. Um, a lot of formal stuff that we need to kind of talk through first before we do anything. And that's first to define what a polynomial is. And we know what polynomials are, but let's get used to seeing this kind of gross looking uh, general form here. So polynomials are functions of this <clears throat> awful looking form here. And all it really is doing is saying that these coefficients, which we're going to call a sub i in our um, in our general form here, so all of these, and this one, and this one, have to be real numbers. All of my powers have to be um, natural numbers. They have to be whole numbers, and they need to be positive whole numbers. And that's really all it's saying, right? All of my a sub whatevers <clears throat> are called coefficients. We know this. We know that the highest power of the variable x, so the highest power, in this case this one, is called the degree. Again, we know this. And it's denoted this way, with this deg of f is equal to n. Um, and part of why I like to show this notation is because we do know what it means. Or we know what polynomials are, coefficients and degree, and it's really now more to show you how to speak the language. Right? It's taking a concept that we're familiar with and writing it in an unfamiliar way so you can learn what it's saying. So for example, here's my polynomial, right? All of my coefficients are real numbers. All of my powers our whole numbers. Oh, that pi is part of the coefficient too. And we have some polynomials that we already know. <coughs> a constant polynomial is just going to be in the function f of x equal to some c. And of course c has to be a real number just like we said above. We know what linear polynomials look like. These look like ax plus b. And the catch is that a and b, or sorry, a can't be zero. And of course, a and b still have to be real numbers. Quadratics, well, we just talked about that in the last section. ax squared plus bx plus c. And a again can't be zero. And of course, my cubic polynomial is going to follow the same sort of structure, except it's going to be uh, third degree. cx plus d, a can't be zero. And all of these a not equal to zero catches here are there because, well, if a was 0, then this is effectively gone and I'm left with a constant, right? If this is effectively gone and I'm left with a linear and so on. And that's just why a can't be 0. That's why we have that catch there. <clears throat> kind of moving on from that, um, if we want to talk about division, we should define what division is. And we have something called this division algorithm. And this is to say for any two polynomials, f and g, we have other unique polynomials, and we're going to call them Q and R, and maybe I'll actually color code them so they make a little, they stick out a little bit better, such that F can be written as the product of G times Q plus R. Well, why did I pick Q and R? Well, that's because I have a quotient and a remainder. I have, so if We've seen this with numbers. We can actually do this with numbers. If I take 15 and divide it by 4, well, this is saying then that I can write 15 as the product of 4 times something times my quotient plus a remainder. So in this case, I can write it as 4 times 3 plus 3. And these obviously don't always have to be equal, right? I could write, if I had 5 divided by 2. I've, I can write 5 as 2 times something plus a remainder, and that something is 2 times 2 plus 1. So that's all it's saying, and we're just extending this out to polynomials, and you'll see that a little bit later on in some of the examples. So all of these theorems right now are really just prior or developing the prior knowledge, and I'll talk about it a little bit later on in the video, or maybe in a part two, depending on how long this goes. Um, 
And then the next two theorems we're going to put in tandem with each other because they are related. Um, the remainder theorem is here just to say that if I have a polynomial and it's got real coefficients, so it's a polynomial, um, if I have some number p that's a real number, then the remainder of f of x when I divide by x minus p is f of p. So it's saying that the remainder of this function divided by this factor, or I guess it's not a factor, this, this I think this divisor, right, um, is equal to the function value at that number. This doesn't seem important right now. Again, I'll talk about it a little later in an example. But what's it, what it's important for right now is this theorem, or I guess really what we call a corollary because it's a side result and a small result that follows from another theorem. So this corollary, which we're gonna call a factor theorem, defines what a factor is. And it says that a polynomial with real coefficients, so just a polynomial, has a factor x minus p, like when p is a real number, if and only if f of p is zero. And that's just to say, if I divide through and I have a remainder of zero, right, because we've said that if f of p is zero, then the remainder is zero. And if the remainder is zero, then it divides evenly, and therefore it's a factor. And that's the same way that we define factors in with numbers, right? Two is a factor of six. Because the remainder is zero. And that's all this is really saying, except again, we're extending it out um, to the polynomials. And we'll see this again um, in a little bit later on.